This briefing was organized in response to congressional offices' interest in this topic, and specifically, we partnered with the Congressional Victims' Rights Caucus to coordinate this event. I want to mention our other key collaborators before we move into the content of the program. They include Pennsylvania State's University Center for Healthy Children and the Global Alliance for Behavioral Health and Social Justice. Our primary sponsors for this afternoon's briefing are the Society for the Psychological Study of Social Issues and the National Prevention Science Coalition. I want to quickly mention that we're going to have an evaluation forum. All of the folks that were involved in putting this together are very much interested in your feedback as we move forward on these issues after today. So I encourage you to pick one of those up and fill it out at the end of our briefing or when you leave. So as Representative Poe mentioned, addressing the problem of human trafficking is challenging. It's not impossible, but it's challenging because it encompasses a range of circumstances, it often overlaps with related crimes, and it can be difficult to measure. We have to consider how factors at the individual, interpersonal, institutional, community, and societal levels all contribute to human trafficking and all could potentially be targeted for intervention. So there is a need for a multi-tiered strategy that better assesses risk and protection, provides an array of services to meet the unique needs of victims and survivors, and reduces the vulnerability of children and youth to trafficking. While we have made progress, researchers and others have noted that the current responses that we have often address the symptoms and not the underlying structural and systemic causes of human trafficking. Many of the programs in the US, which are incredibly important, focused on the response, as the representative was saying, to victims and survivors of human trafficking. By contrast, preventive approaches, when they are present, can in part focus on strengthening vulnerable and at-risk children, increasing their resilience to becoming victims. As noted by the U.S. Department of State and others, the fundamental framework used by the U.S. and others includes what's called the four P's, prevention, protection, prosecution and partnership, and program evaluation. Today, in this briefing, we're going to focus on the lessons learned from the growing research base on the first of those four P's, prevention. We know that the limited evidence base could and should be strengthened through rigorous evaluation of promising prevention and intervention practices that we're going to be discussing today. So it's my pleasure now to turn and to introduce Dr. Jill McLeay. She's the policy liaison for the Global Alliance for Behavioral Health and Social Justice, as well as research assistant professor at the Kempe Center for the Prevention and Treatment of Child Abuse and Neglect at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. She's going to be talking with us today about local strategy development for primary prevention. Dr. McLean. Good afternoon. I um, hope I'm coming through loud and clear. I'm fighting a cold, so um, do the best I can. Um, I'm going to thank Dr. Reed for her presentation. Um, her focus was really on community conditions that um, increase vulnerability, whereas um, my focus is going to be on what we know about efforts to address those vulnerabilities so that we can prevent trafficking before it starts, um, or in other words, primary prevention. So um, I think this quote on the slide um, states it succinctly. Uh, researchers and practitioners have bemoaned the lack of focus on primary prevention, but what do we really know about human trafficking prevention? My colleagues and I, at, um, under the auspices of the Global Alliance for Behavioral Health and Social Justice, um, investigated that question specific to children by conducting a review of the literature that encompassed academic articles, reports from non-governmental organizations, reports from international and um, U.S. governing bodies. Um, we reviewed about 160 documents. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to very briefly um, go over some of those key takeaways so that we have plenty of time to talk about the um, strategies and implications of that research. So one of our key findings was that there is a lack of consensus about the meaning of prevention as it relates to human trafficking. Um, what we often see is that prevention is referred to in terms of prevention from recurrence. So it's intervening after trafficking has already occurred, so to stop it from happening again. Or prevention is equated with educating people to recognize trafficking which by definition is after trafficking has occurred. So often prevention is nearly construed 
to address the symptoms of trafficking and not its underlying structural and systemic causes, as Dr. Uber mentioned in the beginning. Um, so we have this response-based approach instead of primary prevention which really refers to um, promoting healthy environments and behaviors that seek to stop harm from happening before it begins. Um, so what we find when we look at the activities that um, involve prevention, we find awareness raising campaigns and we find education and skill building curricula. Now these strategies are predicated on the assumptions that increasing people's awareness of human trafficking will lead to a reduction in risky behavior, and that the knowledge and skills learned in training workshops will directly translate into effective practical action. Well, awareness raising and educational campaigns have long been understood, or research has shown that they are insufficient to induce the types of changes in behavior um, that we need in most segments of the population. So that although it's a necessary component, it's not sufficient. And one example of why it is ineffective is shown in, in this quote, which is from a survivor of human trafficking who was asked if she had been warned about the dangers of trafficking prior to engaging in the activity. And she said, the, the nightmare I don't know is preferable to the nightmare I live every day at home. So although she knew the dangers of human trafficking, it did not keep her from getting engaged in trafficking. Um, Another thing is, is that the responsibility for addressing prevention is often placed on agencies that are already overburdened and they're designed to address the protection of victims, not to focus on primary <coughs> prevention, for example, child welfare agencies. Um, other things that we found missing in the literature are that demand is often not addressed, or, or when it is, the focus is on legal remedies. And, the, um, and although that's important, we need to be addressing demand through legal remedies. We have a lot more tools in our toolkit that we could be using to fight demand than just the law. Also missing was the discussion of preventing um, individuals from becoming traffickers. Right? So we, and there are some reasons to think that some of the reasons that people become involved in trafficking as traffickers are actually similar to some of the reasons that people become involved in being trafficked. And if we're really going to be comprehensive in the way that we're thinking about human trafficking, we need to be addressing both. So in summary, a lot of what has been learned about what makes individuals and groups vulnerable to trafficking um, is that, um, sorry, a lot has been learned about what makes individuals and groups vulnerable to trafficking um, is prevention of anti-trafficking strategies, but they often do not address the factors that lead to vulnerability to becoming trafficking or to becoming trafficked in the first place. So there's this mismatch about what we know to be the causes of trafficking, what Dr. Reed referred to in her presentation, which she outlined, and what we're actually doing to prevent trafficking. Um, and relatedly, trafficking is not a single isolated problem. You know, often our tendency is to develop programs to deal with a specific problem or a single isolated problem um, that has a reason. Has, has arisen. Um, but often, individuals are not dealing with just one problem or risk factor. And often, the risk factors do not rest solely with that individual. Those risk factors are also found in the family and in the communities in which the individual is embedded. And so, intervening with the youth alone to address an instance of trauma is not necessarily going to have that longer term impact, or is not necessarily going to keep them from engaging in trafficking. So what we need are strategies that focus on changing the environment, which is not to say that individual strategies aren't also needed. However, we do need to be focusing on community-based community, community -based strategies additionally. Now having a, a community-based strategy, some of the advantages of a community-based strategy is that they are population-focused which allows us to reach individuals with varying levels of risk. So those not yet labeled at risk um, also can be reached. So those people who are maybe um, at lower risk but are at risk for developing behaviors and lifestyles that will put them at higher risk, reaching them before they become labeled high risk, in other words. It also allows us to avoid the stigma of being labeled at risk. Um, also important about a community-based strategy is that it addresses the environmental and social conditions that shape the lifestyles 
and the behavioral risk factors that are often not under the direct control of the individual. Now, most of us who are involved in this task force focused on child trafficking prevention had a background working in child protection in some way or fashion. And all of us became concerned when we were doing this literature review that we were at risk of, of coming to making the same mistakes that had been made in the child protection system. That is, not fully understanding the nature of the problem, the extent of the problem, and by relying on a single governmental agency to address the problem, rather than creating a sense of community responsibility for the safety of children. So in thinking about strategies to prevent trafficking before it occurs, we turn to lessons that have been learned from the child maltreatment field. This is not to say that we're saying child maltreatment can be equated exactly or is the same as child trafficking, but there are a lot of similarities, and as Dr. Reed pointed out, in a high risk factor for trafficking is child maltreatment. Further, a lot of the vulnerabilities for a child being maltreated are very similar to the vulnerabilities for a child being trafficked. And the child maltreatment field has been around a lot longer than the child trafficking field. And so we, we, it would be, um, we would be um, going in the wrong direction not to learn from the child maltreatment field. So in the next two slides, in two minutes, I'm just gonna give a brief um, overview of the evolution of what we've learned from um, child-based child maltreatment prevention. So in 1993, the report you see a picture of here on your right um, came out from the U.S. Advisory Board on Child Abuse and Neglect. This report was the culmination of years of intensive review of the literature on what we know about the factors that bring families into the child protection system. In that report, the advisory board called for a neighborhood-based child, prote child protection strategy um, that was focused on increasing collective responsibility for family support and child protection. Again, in response to the literature review, they said that what we need to know or address these, what we need to do to address these causes like poverty, social isolation, or criminal depression, things we all now know to be risk factors in child protection, but in 1993, this research was just coming out, um, that we need something more than just this agency response, identification um, strategy. And that, what we've learned to be the causes, the root causes of child maltreatment has only increased um, since 1993. And I really um, appreciate this quote from Deb Darrow and Ken Dodge from an article in 2009 in which they stated that attention has shifted to creating environments that facilitate a parent's ability to do the right thing. It is increasingly recognized that environmental forces can overwhelm even well-intentioned parents. Communities can support parents in their role and public expenditures might be most cost beneficial if directed toward community strategies. Um, so what exactly did the report recommend? Um, for set time's sake, I'm just going to briefly review the key themes that were identified by the U.S. Advisory Board. One, when they um, recommended a neighborhood-based strategy, what they were saying is we need community mobilization, and not just community mobilization for its own sake. It needs to be, it needs to have certain characteristics. It needs to be asset-based. We need to build on the strengths that are already in existence within individual communities. This um, community mobilization needs to focus on changing norms within communities. It needs to be universal. And it needs to increase sense of confidence, both among parents, but also among community members. And that, that community, mo community mobilization needs to be focused on what, what I've termed resources plus this idea of making sure that families have what they need to support their children, financial resources, but also very importantly, the social resources, the relationships they need. I mean, we've created agency responsibility for families, but what we really need is, in addition to that, neighborhood and community responsibility for families. And that families need access to services, both formal and informal. And those informal networks happen, those informal, um, types of support happen when the social relationships are present. So we need to be creating environments where families can reach out and get help without stigma. So we identified two efforts that I'm gonna briefly just bring to your attention today that um, seem to fit those parameters, those guidelines. Um, one is Strong Communities, which is an effort I was involved in in two counties in South Carolina that was the first attempt to actualize 
what the advisory board recommended, and that was to instill a community-based child um, protection strategy. So it was a universal and comprehensive approach that relied on the engagement of volunteers and primary community institutions, and by primary community institutions, I mean child care centers, civic groups, local governments, public um, service agencies, faith communities, schools, to mobilize the community and then to provide direct services to um, families. I could say a lot more about how the um, initiative was actually carried, about, um, carried out, but in the limited time I have, I'm, I'm not gonna say that much about it. I do, however, if you're interested in learning more, have a handout that has um, more information about places that you can go to learn more about the initiative itself and the background research that led to the, um, the initiative. I will say, that it, in relation to it had an extensive evaluation component and that in relation to a comparison group, the strong community sample showed significant changes in the expected direction for social support and collective efficacy. Again, this idea that when we increase these resources for families, that we then will see an increase, which we did, in child safety in the home, observed parenting practices, um, decline in parental stress, um, increased sense of parental efficacy and self-reported parenting practices, and probably most importantly, um, declined rates of child maltreatment and rates of icd 9 coded child injury suggesting child maltreatment. Um, I also want to bring to your attention another model, which has not been initiated in the United States, um, but it's a model of an organization called Free the Slaves, which some of you might be familiar with. They have a, they utilize a community-based model for fighting slavery. Um, it's a four-phase model, which looks a lot like the logic model that was employed by strong communities. I mean, it's really focused on strengthening the entire community. Um, the idea that when we build communities, people who break free from trafficking won't fall back into it because they have those community supports and that people will not engage in trafficking to begin with because they have the supports in place um, and alternatives in place. This model too, another reason that I'm pointing it out is that it underwent a fairly extensive evaluation very similar to the one Strong Communities underwent. The evaluation was carried out by Harvard Center for Health and Human Rights. Um, this is a copy of the cover of it right now. It's called When We Raise Our Voice, The Challenge of Erad Eradicating Labor Exploitation. I should highlight that this effort was focused on exclusively on labor exploitation. Um, and what they found, and you can again read the report yourself to get the full um, ins and outs, but they did find a reduced a reduction in indebtedness and threats of violence. They found improved wage levels and sense of collective efficacy in their model. Um, in closing, I just want to say what all this means for um, federal policymakers. What are the opportunities for federal policy? One is to facilitate community efforts to protect children and to support evaluation of such efforts so that we can see if they do indeed work. Also, to include community-based primary prevention and grants and other funding mechanisms for efforts related to human trafficking. Also, in RFPs, and this holds for private foundations as well, require human trafficking impact statements. You know, what is the impact of X, Y, or Z program on the prevention of human trafficking? And also have task, um, have task forces, such as the Bureau of Justice Assistance Task Forces, place greater emphasis on primary prevention. And last, lastly, um, the federal government policymakers can use the bully pulpit to establish norms about what we should be doing as community, mem uh, community members and as neighbors to help keep our kids